Welcome to Lecture 2, Part 3, which is on electron configurations. The Pauli exclusion principle states that no two electrons in an atom can have the same set of four quantum numbers. The existence and energy of an electron in an atom is uniquely described by its wave function. In the multi-electron system, the shell is designated by all the electrons that have the same value of n. In the single electron system, the energy level of an electron is determined solely by this value of n. That is not the case for the multi-electron system. In the multi-electron system, the subshell determines the energy of the electron. All electrons with the same values of n, the principal quantum number, and L, the angular momentum quantum number, will be in the same subshell and have the same energy. All the orbitals in the subshell will have the same uh, energy and have the same values of n and l, but their values of m sub l will be different. The values of the spin quantum number, m sub s, can either be plus one half or minus one half as we had previously seen, designating that there can only be two electrons per orbital. So let's answer this question. How many 2p orbitals are there in an atom? The 2 in 2p simply designates the value of the principal quantum number and has no value with designating how many p orbitals that there are other than stating that the p orbital does exist in the second energy level. Each p orbital, however, has an angular momentum quantum number of 1 and since L equals 1, the possible values for M sub L, the magnetic quantum number, are negative 1, 0, or 1, giving us three p-type orbitals. Each one is the same in energy, but they are oriented in space in different directions. How many electrons can be placed in the 3D subshell? First of all, the 3 in the 3D designates that the principal quantum number is 3, and a d orbital is a possible orbital for the quantum number of 3. Each d orbital has an angular momentum quantum number of 2, giving us possible values for the magnetic quantum number of minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1 or 2 for a total of 5 3d orbitals. But since each orbital can hold two electrons, the 3d subshell as a total can hold 10 electrons. The Aufbau principle or the filling up principle basically states that we are going to put the electrons in their lowest energy levels first and then fill them up according to energy level. When putting electrons in the orbitals in an orbital diagram, we use the arrow to designate their spin. An up arrow designates a spin quantum number of plus one half. A down arrow designates a spin quantum number of minus one half. They can be put in in either order either up then down or down then up. The convention is to put the up spin first then put the down. However it can be done either way. What you don't want to do is to put both of them with the same spin. Hun's rule tells us that the most stable arrangement of electrons in a subshell is the one with the greatest number of parallel spins. Nitrogen has seven electrons. 
we've put the first two in the 1s orbital, the second two in the 2s orbital, leaving three electrons. All the three remaining electrons can be placed in the 2p subshell since it can hold up to six electrons. Since there are three different 2p orbitals, we are going to put one electron in each orbital with the same spin. They can either be all spin up, as seen here in the diagram, or we could actually put them all in spin down. Either way is acceptable as long as they all have the same spin. This diagram gives us a way of ordering the energy levels. When electrons are filling up the energy levels, the energy levels split and they don't go in a systematic order after the 3p orbital. So what I've done with this diagram is shown all the orbitals that are used on the current periodic table. If you follow a diagonal up, it will tell you what orbital to put electrons in or what subshell to put electrons in. After you go from the 1s, you follow the arrow up and the next orbital is the 2s. Following arrow 3, you come to the 2p. Following it up continually on the diagonal, you come to the 3s. On the fourth diagonal, we come to the 3p, but we do not go over to the 3d. We continue up the diagonal and get to the 4s. And then we travel up the fifth diagonal, encounter the 3d, and finish off the fourth period with the 4p subshell. And the electrons continue to fill from there. What we will find, however, is that in the transition metals and the inner transition metals, there are some anomalies that occur in the filling up some of these anomalies are explainable, some of them aren't as explainable. Uh, we will not significantly worry about a majority of those. When writing an electron configuration, you first write the principal quantum number. You then give the angular quantum number as the orbital type, and then as a superscript you designate the number of electrons that are in that orbital, if it's an s orbital, or in the subshell for p, d, and f subshells. We can also draw orbital diagrams instead of in the stair step fashion that we saw previously. They can actually be drawn as boxes, where here's the 1s, here is the 2s, and here would be the 2p uh, subshells. So let's do the electron configuration of magnesium. Magnesium is element number 12, so in its neutral state it will have 12 electrons. So we're going to start out with 12 remaining. We're going to put the first two electrons in the 1s, because that's always the first place we put them. And as you can see in the orbital diagram here, we put 1, 2 in the 1s. In the electron configuration, 1s with a superscript of 2, leaving 10 electrons that now have to be placed. The next orbital, following up diagonal 2, is the 2s orbital. We're going to put two electrons in the 2s orbital designated 2s2, leaving 8 electrons. After the 2s, following the diagonal up, we come into the 2p subshell. The 2p subshell can hold a total of 6 electrons, and since we have 8 left, we are going to fill it up with 6 total electrons. Designation there, 2p6. That leaves us with two electrons. The next orbital up in the diagram is the 3s. 
3s can hold two electrons. We have two electrons remaining. We're going to put both those electrons in the 3s to finish our electron configuration. The way we would say this would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and 3s2. Upon thinking about these electron configurations, imagine having to do such elements as lead or uh, uranium with their incredibly large numbers of electrons. The electron configurations would get incredibly long. We can use the electron configurations of the noble gases to abbreviate our electron configurations. The abbreviated form of the noble gas is designated by placing the elemental symbol in square brackets. Note that with the exception of helium, the noble gas electron configurations end with a full P subshell. And below in this table are the electron configurations of helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. We can then use them to help us in determining the electron configuration in a more abbreviated form. So let's look at the configuration of molybdenum. Molybdenum is element number 42. So 42 electrons is a lot to put in an orbital diagram or a lot to put in an electron configuration. Without going through the actual process of it, molybdenum becomes 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, 5s2, 4d4. That's a lot of orbital designations. However, we can cut off a lot of what's going on down at this end because once we get out to the 4p subshell we now have a full set that corresponds to the electron configuration of krypton. So an abbreviated form would be to take this whole area right in here and designated as krypton in square brackets followed by what remains at the end. The question you may ask is how do you determine how much to use what's left over and which element to use as the abbre in the abbreviated form? Well the answer comes in looking at the periodic table Molybdenum is in the fifth period of the periodic table. So if I go down to the end of the periodic table and I look at the noble gas at the end of the fourth period of the periodic table, I find that that element is krypton. Then the remaining electrons will be added after krypton. So writing out that designation, we would put krypton in the brackets and knowing that krypton is element element 36 out of these 42 electrons we can remove 36 of them which leaves six more to put in now how do I know where to start after I write krypton again noting that molybdenum is in the fifth period we are going to start out with the 5s, put two electrons in the 5s. This is on the line that I've designated 5. We then follow the line designated 6, and the next orbital is the 4d. And since there are four electrons left, we're going to put those in the 4d subshell. And this completes the abbreviated electron configuration. Using this table that I've been 
drawing, we can actually put a little bit more information on there to help us out. At the top, I've shown that there are two electrons in each S shell, six electrons in each P subshell, ten electrons in each D subshell, and fourteen electrons in each F subshell. I've also put in here at the end of each period the noble gases and when they get filled up. Helium is filled up at 1s2, neon is filled up 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and so forth. If you know what noble gas you're working with, then you know where to start next. Well, now it's time to have a little bit of fun. We are going to do the electron configuration of bismuth, which is element 83. So we have 83 electrons that we have to put in our electron configuration. Bismuth is in period number 6. Going up to period number 5 and looking at the element that's at the end of that period, the noble gas, we find that the noble gas is xenon. Xenon is element number 54, so it uses up 54 of the 83 electrons that we need to put in the electron configuration. That still leaves quite a few electrons. A total of, it looks like, about 29 more electrons need to be added. Well, xenon being at the end of the fifth period stops here. Bismuth's in the sixth period, so we are going to start with the 6s. We're going to put two electrons in the 6s, leaving 27 electrons. Following the next diagonal, we come to the 4f. The F subshell can hold 14 total electrons. We have more than 14, so we're going to put 14 electrons in the 4F. That leaves 13 electrons. Next orbital, 5D. The D subshell can hold 10 electrons. There are more than 10, so I'm going to put 10 electrons in the 5D, leaving 3 electrons. The final orbital that we need is the 6P. 6P subshells can hold 6 electrons. There are 3 left. I'm going to put all 3 in that subshell. This is the abbreviated electron configuration of bismuth. Thus far we've been talking about electron configurations. What we've basically been stating is the ground state electron configuration. That is putting the electrons in their lowest possible energy, one spin up, the other spin down, or parallel spins according to Hund's rule. However, electrons don't always stay where we put them in the ground state. Just look at a fluorescent light bulb or a neon discharge tube or such. Once we add electricity or some kind of energy, the electrons move out of their ground state into what are called excited states. There's generally only one ground state and multitudes of excited states. The ground state of magnesium, as we previously saw, was 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and then 3s2. Any different electron configuration would be an excited state. Like we see down here, one of the electrons in the 3s shell was promoted to a 3p subshell and therefore it has a little bit of extra energy. It's in an excited state. The question you might ask then is how can I determine if I have an excited state. 
One of the best ways to do that is to look at everything except for the last subshell or orbital. If all of those are filled and then the next orbital is appropriately filled, it's probably in the ground state. However, if one of the lower subshells has a different number than what it's supposed to be filled with, for example, a P subshell only has five electrons, it's probably in an excited state. Or if the next, elect the next set of orbitals don't look correct according to our ordering, then that would be an excited state. This last section looks at the electron configurations of the elements in the periodic table and helps us to understand some basic patterns and exceptions to patterns, which are numerous. This table shows us the electron configurations of the elements in the representative or the main group the core electrons, that is the electrons that correspond to the noble gas electron configuration of the previous period are left out. Looking here at group one, if you'll notice these are all S1 orbital designations. Looking at group two, these are all S2 orbital designations. When we go a little further, uh, we start getting some D and F subshells in there, so it, it gets kind of crowded, but let's see what we can do to take a look uh, in here at the different uh, groups. Group 13, you'll notice, ends in P1. Group 14, these end in P2. As you would guess, group 15, P3. Group 16, P4. Group 17, P5. Might also note that we do not see any exceptions to these uh, rules that we've just established. This gives us some consistency in the periodic properties observed amongst these elements, which we will discuss in a later chapter. The transition metals tend to be a little weird. They kind of do their own thing. When looking at lanthanum and actinium, if we filled it up according to our orbital designation, after putting in the two electrons in the S, sub S orbital, the next electron should go in an F subshell. However, what we find is that it does not. That's an exception to the rule. Chromium and molybdenum, in order to get the maximum number of parallel spins, and a lower energy configuration, take one of the S subshell or electrons and promotes it or puts it in the 3D subshell or the 4D subshell, basically giving these two elements six unpaired electrons. However, if you see below that, tungsten and suborgium do not do the same thing. Then we have this group here in the middle that kind of have their own way of uh, accomplishing uh, low energy states. And then copper and silver are similar to chromium and molybdenum in that they promote an electron from the S orbital up to the D subshell and the reason for doing this, in this case, 
Oh, also gold. Forgot to mention that. It's also gold. They promote it to the D subshell to give the D subshell a full subshell, which tends to be a more stable configuration. And then finally, looking over here at group 12, the S and D subshells are completely full. This gives them some uh, special properties in that they don't tend to act like the rest of the transition metals. Most transition metals will form multiple different cations or have multiple different oxidation states, whereas zinc, cadmium, and, and mercury uh, don't do that as much. Zinc and cadmium only have one primary oxidation state at plus two, and mercury has two oxidation states. Uh, one is an unusual one at plus one, and then the normal one at plus two. We can also look at the periodic table in the form of uh, what block of elements or what orbitals are being filled in a certain block of elements. Over here in groups one and two, and then we got to throw in uh, helium which is over here in group 18, uh, they're putting electrons in the S subshell, so we call them S block electrons. Groups 13 through 18, with the exception of helium, are the P block, because we are putting electrons in the P subshells. In the middle are the transition metals. Electrons go into the D subshells there, and so we call those the D block. And then finally, the inner transition metals down here at the bottom. Electrons are going into the F subshell, so we call those the F block. This is the expanded periodic table. It's basically what the periodic table would look like if we uh, stuck everything in according to the order of the orbitals that they were filled and put the, all the different blocks in their appropriate places it gets very large and extensive. For that reason we pull the F block out and insert it underneath the D block just for uh, convenience sake.